Welcome to the British Home Front in the First World War. This series was recorded at the University of St Andrews in June 2018 to accompany a conference marking the contribution by the peoples of the British Isles to the national war effort. In this set of podcasts, we look at trade unions and the rise of the Labour Party, conscription, charitable work and refugees, internees and prisoners of war. We hear first from Professor Chris Wrigley about trade unions and the rise of Labour. I'm Chris Wrigley, Emeritus Professor of History at Nottingham University, and I'm going to talk about Labour and the trade unions. The key thing about Labour and the trade unions is that the war saw something like 40% of the male labour force of army age taken out for the armed forces. So you've got this huge withdrawal of labour, something like 5.6 million men during the length of the war. And this has a big impact on the negotiating strength of trade unions. If one thinks of past British trade union history, there's two big features. One is that it was large compared to other countries. You have something like over 4 million trade unionists in 1914, If you go back about 20 years, you'd find that this is much, much bigger than Germany. Germany catches up, but Germany's unusual that the SPD, the Socialist Party Deutschland, is bigger than the trade unions. If you think of Britain, it's the other way around. The trade unions stem from the 18th century, and the Labour Party, compared to other European countries, is relatively late. It formed in effect in 1900. It calls itself the Labour Party from 1906. But until 1914, it's almost an auxiliary force to the Liberals. It has 29 MPs in 1906. It has 40 in January 1910, 42 in December 1910. But these are all pretty well due to a pact with the Liberals that they have a free run in certain seats. The increase from 1906 to 10 is virtually all due to the affiliation of the Miners' Federation of Great Britain. So one could say that before 1914, British Labour was in a cosy arrangement with the Liberal Party, which suited the Liberals and the early Labour Party. But it was not going to be a party contending for office. Within a year or two of the start of the First World War, all manner of people were writing in diaries and private letters that it's only a matter of time before there is a Labour Party in office. So the war transforms its position. It also means that the Labour Party is no longer dependent on the Liberals. By the end of the war, it is a totally separate party. It is reorganised by Arthur Henderson, who was the leading trade unionist. He had been in effect, I say in effect because the party didn't have a leader, it had a chairman of the parliamentary party, and he had been chairman of the parliamentary party in 1908 to 10, and he took over when Ramsay MacDonald resigned at the start of the war. And so Henderson because of the strength of the trade unions, goes into the cabinet under Asquith. He holds two ministerial posts in succession. He is then one of the small number of war cabinet ministers under Lloyd George. But nevertheless, in all these cases, he was there because he was going to deal with labour unrest. He was the government's troubleshooter for industrial relations. Arthur Henderson was from the North East. He worked originally in an iron foundry in Stevenson's, as in the locomotives, but Stevenson's in Newcastle. He stood as a Lib Lab candidate in the council election and was elected He was very much in this kind of liberal tradition. He actually left his employment to be the agent of a liberal MP in Barnard Castle. And when the liberal MP died, Henderson stood 
as a Labour candidate, backed by the Iron Founders Union. He was still a union official. He was elected as one of the very few three-cornered fights that Labour won at that time. So he was the fifth Labour MP. He was notable because he was moderate. He was a very good organiser. He had been the full-time agent for the Liberals. So he became the organiser of victory for the Labour Party. And he was very effective at this. The trade unions were made stronger by this huge withdrawal of labour to the armed forces. Roughly 40% of all men of the age who could have been drawn into the army. If one thinks of trade union history in the past, labour and the trade unions were strong when there were upturns in the economy. The First World War is a glorified upturn in the economy. You have huge demand, you have a shortage of manpower, you do have alternative labour like elderly people, women and prisoners of war, but on the whole the civilian workforce drops by over two million and it does mean that those who are in war areas like engineering are in very strong bargaining position. So the government, when it wants to increase coal for the steamships and for industry, they need the miners' cooperation. Equally, they need engineers to produce the munitions. The engineers are well unionized, and so they deploy Henderson, who is the leading trade unionist in the House of Commons, to ensure that they get continued production. Henderson gets himself constructively dismissed from the cabinet in 1917. Lloyd George puts him on the doormat, was the phrase. He kept him outside the cabinet room, though he was a cabinet member. They agree he should go and he resigns. But he then goes off and he reorganises the Labour Party. He is part of the reorganisation of the ideas of the Labour Party. It moves to a socialist programme. It's a much more effective organisation than before. The strength of the Labour Party draws from trade unionism. The trade unionism spreads through the war. You get groups who had never been unionised before become unionised. You have groups who are not directly in war work who become unionised, white-collar workers, accountants and other people. Before the First World War, probably a fifth of the workforce were in collective bargaining, collective bargaining being where both sides of industry come together and get to an agreement. In Britain, something like a million miners were covered by collective agreements. In Germany, under 40 miners were covered. So you find that Britain has much more of this kind of cooperation in industry than many other countries. And the war accelerates this The government does not want people to negotiate factory by factory, so you get nationwide collective agreements. You also have the spread of joint councils. Henderson had been in these in the iron industry in the northeast. These joint councils bring the employers and workers together. They become widespread in industries hitherto unaffected by this type of agreement. The national government wants trade unionists involved at all stages in all things. They become almost a fourth estate of the realm. Local councils bring trade unionists in, so trade councils suddenly find that they're significant in many places across the country. The trade unions themselves go from 4 million-odd members to over 6 million By the end of 1920, they actually hit over 8 million, the biggest number until after the Second World War. This means greater strength for the trade unions. They've got the members, the members are paying fees, 
The members are not unemployed, they're not paying unemployment benefits, and they're not, in theory, going on strike, because strikes are illegal from 1915. The union funds are getting bigger and bigger, and at the end of the war, though only certain of the union funds can be used for political purposes, the unions are funding Labour candidates. And you look at places like Durham, the union is funding a whole number of full-time agents, they're funding a large number of sub-agents, and they're funding several hundred people who will work for the Labour Party and the union on the election day. So they are doing this at a time when the Liberal Party is fragmenting and weakening. This all, I think, stems from the growth and strength of the trade unions in the war. One of the surprising features about the war is the level of industrial unrest. Now, this is partly due to the fact that the government controls so much of industry. Wages are held down, but prices aren't, unlike the Second World War. In the Second World War, you find the government controls food by rationing. It controls other essentials by subsidies. In the First World War, it doesn't. And the net effect is that during the war, prices go up and up. Wages go up, but much more slowly. And so you find that real wages, i.e. what you can buy with your money, drops. And so you have people who are experiencing hardship during the war. If you were a married woman with your husband at the front and you had children and prices were going sky high, you were not going to have a good time. I remember reading in a local newspaper of one woman in 1915 who was a soldier's wife being put in the workhouse because she couldn't cope with the price rises. So this is why there were strikes during the wartime. There was unrest in the engineering industry. You have skilled men who were on reasonably high pay who were objecting to women or unskilled men coming in and doing work. Now, they you might call conservative with a small c, but you also have more militant objections to this type of thing. You find the more red shop stewards were objecting because the state controlled these industries. This didn't mean they nationalized them. The profits were going to the owners. But they said what was happening was these owners were making huge profits. The workers were controlled and it was completely wrong that the profit should go to the private employer and not to the state. The other unrest is in the mining sector. Coal is in, again, huge demand. You want coal for the Navy and they want particular coal from South Wales for the steamships. You want coal for steam for much of industry for electricity. You have the civil population who want coal fires in winter. You have coal which is needed for the Allies. The French coal mines have been overrun. Belgium is occupied. So coal is in huge demand. The miners were amongst those who enlisted under voluntary enlistment. You had probably a fifth of the miners going, and this means the miners are in a strong position. The Munitions of War Act of the 2nd of July 1915 regulates not just munitions factories, but all kind of war needs. This act comes in, and people could be imprisoned for striking. Lloyd George faces 100,000 miners in South Wales who all said we'll all march to jail if we do not get our demands. Very soon they get nearly all their demands. During the war, the prices go up and wages never catch up. People don't go on strike in most sectors because they feel the lads are in the trenches. But once the armistice has come, they feel they can demand wages which will match the price rises or even better than that. 
and you have a huge outpouring of strikes in early 1919. This is the so-called Red Months. In 1918, they said, well, the armistice isn't the end of the war. It won't be ended till the treaty is actually signed. And so many men felt they had been conned, and they then have demobilization riots. But this is not revolution. It's just wanting to go home. Lloyd George was idolised by many, not just in Wales, as the radical who got things done before the First World War. He and Churchill had brought in many of the liberal social reforms which were precursors of the welfare state. He was seen as a man on the left, a defender of the poor. As such, he was seen as someone who could talk to Labour and who could bring them into national organisations during the First World War. The Conservatives were aware of the strength of trade unionism, of the growth in significance of the Labour Party. And so when it came to the end of the war, the Conservatives felt that it was a good idea to back the man who the tabloids referred to as the man who won the war, and they felt that this was a winning ticket. For Lloyd George, it was too good a winning ticket. Lloyd George got a bigger victory than anyone had anticipated. The trouble was that the coalition Conservatives, plus a few independent Conservatives, amounted to over half the House of Commons. As such, they did not need the coalition Liberals in terms of parliamentary seats. Lloyd George was head of the coalition Liberals, so it was a question of time how long he would last. But he was the dominant figure at the end of the war. He goes on to the peace conference and is seen as one of the great figures. He and Clemenceau, President Wilson, and to a lesser extent Orlando, recreate the map of Europe. 1919 is his height of powers, I think. But he is very much deemed up till 1920 as almost essential by the Conservatives in keeping the general working-class public happy so that they're not going to turn to Bolshevism. The huge growth in trade unions is undercut by the 1921 recession. That was as severe in Britain as the 1931-33 recession. As a result of the 21 recession, wages dropped, prices dropped, and trade union membership dropped. Trade union membership starts to recover in the 20s, and then it's hit by the 31-33 period, and it drops again. For me, the interesting point is that even in 33, trade unionism is at a higher level than in 1914. The number of women in trade unionism drops in these recessions. Women made certain gains in the First World War, They did keep gains in the labour market in things like shops and banks, white-collar work and distribution work. But on the whole, a lot was lost after the war. In terms of the Labour Party, the odd thing is that after serious industrial unrest, trade unionism is having a hard time, but the Labour Party itself continues to win by-elections during 1921 and 22. It goes up in numbers in the 22 general election. In 1923, it becomes the second biggest party by a long way. And at the start of 24, when Baldwin resigns, it forms the first minority Labour government. So Labour has moved from 1914, where if you landed in a spaceship and said, this lot are going to form a government with 10 years, you'd look with incredulity and jump back in the spaceship. It was not realistic. So 1914 to 24 is when Labour goes from being a minority party linked to the Liberals 
into being a party which can form a government. That was Professor Chris Wrigley on trade unions and the rise of the Labour Party. You have been listening to the British Home Front in the First World War. The podcast series was made possible thanks to the generosity of John Cawthorne and the 1926 Foundation. The conference was supported by the Department for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport and the Scottish Government. It was a Chrome Radio production for the University of St Andrews, with music by the pipes and drums of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards. The producer was Katrina Oliphant, with sound design by Chris Sharp. The series editor was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn. In our next podcast, we hear from Professor Ian Beckett about enlistment and conscription.